Chapter 2 The Art of Reading Buildings Okay, in this chapter we're going to look at defining loads and imposition of loads as they relate to buildings, list the three types of forces created from imposed loads, explain the effects of fire on common building materials, list the factors that determine the suitability of a building material for a given application, describe the relationship of surface to mass ratios and fire degradation for building materials, and finally differentiate the term native wood, traditional wood products, and engineered wood products. The sections in this chapter are why should you read this chapter? Two, loads. Three, building material characteristics. Four, specific building materials. And of course, the chapter review exercise at the end. So, why should you read this chapter? The uh, fire officer who reads this chapter are better prepared to not only read a building, but better prepared to communicate building problems, hazards, and collapse potentials. Likewise, it's important to learn common terms that is used with building construction and engineering in the field. This language will help you teach new firefighters and prepare a more complete pre-fire plan, interact with building representatives and engineers during an incident. Now, it is important to note the intent here in this chapter is not like Brannigan's in, in terms of trying to make you a building engineer. However, we do want you to have uh, basic terms and concepts that come from building construction world that will help provide a bridge to that 2 a.m. fire suppression world. Now, this chapter also addresses an evolving issue that is pretty prevalent in the fire service today. Now, I can remember when I came along, and even to this point today, you would have uh, everybody working a second job. I mean, you could literally walk into a fire department and probably build a house with all the different uh, tradespeople that were there. You know, I can remember having a contractor, working with a contractor, um, a builder, uh, roofing guys, fencing guys, electrical guys. So they all had this already construction trade knowledge, which of course is very important. So building construction really wasn't hit heavily during the training process because it was given as a common knowledge. People already knew it, so they didn't really have to harp on it. Unfortunately today, this has kind of left a gap because if we look at the new generation coming in, you know, they're more apt with, you know, gigabytes and phones and apps and and computers and things of that nature. So when you start doling out these terms to them, uh, such as load, header, trusses, gusset plates, things of that nature, they are totally lost and, and they don't have... Um, the knowledge or the hands-on ability to relate that to something. But, of course, you know, people are smart. Well, most of them anyway. So they have the capability of, of learning this, and it is up to you as the fire officer or the mentor or whatever the case may be to impart this knowledge. And, of course, if you are one of the younger generations, this text gives you a great understanding of what they're talking about in terms of building construction, why it is important, and the things to look for, to be cautious for, so you're not walking into a death trap per se. So overall, to be better prepared for reading buildings and to learn the language of the building industry is the two main focuses on why you should read this chapter and of course we're all busy people and notorious about uh, eh, I already know enough building construction terms I'm just gonna wing it I've got more important things to do like to review questions at the end 
But no, let's let's go through it, and it'll be a good review for some and new information for others. So let's jump into loads. To be sound, a building must be designed, engineered, or otherwise assembled to resist a load. Now, it's important to know that loads are static and dynamic weight that come from a building itself and anything that is placed within or act upon a building. Gravity is responsible for creating most loads as any natural or human created thing that has weight is pulled to the planet's surface by gravity. Likewise, gravity is trying to flatten a building always. It's the ever vigilant enemy, so to speak, whether the building is on fire or not. And you have other factors that will come into play, such as wind, rain, snow, and of course just the breakdown of the material itself. So let's look at these key terms. Dead loads which is the weight of the building itself and anything, and here's the key word, permanently attached to the buildings. So a good example would be like AC units or um, concrete pillars. Again, anything attached to the building itself. Live loads are any loads applied to a building other than dead loads. And live loads are typically transient, meaning that they're moving, impacting, or static, such as furniture, safes, things of that nature. Now, live and dead loads can be further classified as to their application nature, such as concrete load, which is a load that is applied within a small area or at one point, or excuse me, concentrated load. I think I said concrete load. It's concentrated load. You also have distributed load, which is a load spread over a large surface area or over multiple points. You have impact load, which is a moving or sudden load applied to a building in a focus or short time interval. For example, wind, large crowds, water from fire streams are all considered impact loads. Repeated load, which are loads that are transient or intermittently applied, like people on an escalator is a good example of a repeated load. Static load, are constant loads that rarely moves. A suspended load is a load that is hanging from something above. Wind and snow load are atmospheric loads that stress a building. Now the fire service uses the term fire load, which is the potential amount of heat energy measured in BTUs or British thermal units that may be released when a material is burning. The term fire load is not a building engineering term. It's purely a fire service one. So let's not get confused on that. Load and position. Now a firefighter team making a panel cut on a pitched wooden roof for heat ventilation can be classified as a live impact and distributed load. The firefighters are the live load and the movement of the firefighters are the impact load. And of course the ladder that they are um, standing on and the beams are distributing the firefighters weight as a distributed load. That live impact and distributed load is imposed, meaning placed, on the roof and its supporting elements. The imposition of loads refers to the contact orientation. And when we're looking at this contact orientation, we have axial, eccentric, and torsion. Axial load is 
transposed through the center of the material as seen here to the right, straight down force. Eccentric load is imposed off center causing material that, that basically wanting it to bend. And then a torsion load is imposed in such a way that it causes a material to twist. Now force is resisting loads. Imposition loads on a given material causes stress within the receiving material. These stresses are called forces and forces help resist that load meaning it prevents it from you know getting compressed or, or turning or bending over. So when we're looking at our forces Compression is a stress that causes the material to flatten or crush. Tension is a stress that causes material to pull apart or stretch. And then we have shear, which is a stress that causes material to tear or slide apart. Special note here, there are very few buildings and structure applications that deliver a load to the earth in any force other than compression. With the exception of guy wire anchors that are drilled deep into the earth for a suspension bridge or tower antenna are the noted exception. They are delivered in tension or shear forces. So let's do a quick summary here on what's important in this section. It is important to know that loads are static and dynamic weights that exist within or on a building. There are typically two loads that exist within every building, live and dead loads. Live and dead loads can be further classified as impact, suspended, distributed, and concentrated. Fire load is primarily, again, a fire service concept referring to uh, the material that is in the structure and the projected heat or energy in BTUs that it can produce. Loads are imposed three ways, actually, eccentrical, and torsional. Imposed loads create forces within materials such as compression, tension, and shear. Looking in your text on page 13, figure 2-2 and 2-1 show great examples of this. Building material characteristics. Now, if you're able to visualize and understand the, the concept in the last section, you know, you're, you're well on your way. Now, it is important to understand what gives that material strength to resist these forces. So, within any given factor, it is important to know what the material is what the shape of the material is in, in terms of orientation, mass, material, and surface in order to dictate how long that particular support structure will be able to resist gravity and those forces from collapsing. So when we're looking at the types of materials, you have you know, such things as wood, steel, and concrete. The shape of the material also plays an important role, such as round, square, and rectangle. Orientation of the plane of the material, such as vertical and horizontal, are also a factor to consider. And of course, the mass of the material, such as the surface to mass ratio, the density and depth. The material surface should also be considered such as, you know, something that is rough, slippery, hard, or adhesion connection a building. 
Additionally, the fire service looks at how these materials react during a fire and how their ability to resist a load changes during different fire conditions. Of importance to us is the concept of surface to mass ratio. The more mass or dense a material has relative to its exposed surface area, the more it is resistant to heat. Now we learn in fire behavior class that concepts of heat flow um, from hot to cold, heat seeks cold, uh, you know, the heat runs from one side of the beam to the other, and if you got any boxes touching the other side of the beam, that um, it'll catch fire. Now, materials exposed to radiant heat or other building material serves as a heat sink, and the amount of heat the material can absorb before it starts breaking down is directly proportionate to that surface mass ratio. In essence, mass is heat resistant, and heat resistant is time, and of course time is always the eternal enemy of firefighting. You know, the more something burns, the quicker it is going to collapse, especially in this day and age where we're looking at modern uh, construction. And we'll go more into this in later chapters. Now, when we're looking at that surface area, a, a good example uh, I like to point out is the whole uh, board. So you got the two by four board and you try to light it on fire with a torch. Now it's going to resist that heat for quite some time uh, until it starts heating up to that certain temperature where the material begins to break down and pyrolysis occurs and off-gassing and then that gas is what burns. Now if you take that same 2x4 and you grind it up into sawdust and you take the same torch and you try lighting both of them together, which is going to burn quicker. And the one that's going to start quicker to burn, of course, is the sawdust, because this is, again, in direct proportion to that surface mass ratio, because you have more surface area being exposed to that heat, so it burns quicker. The engineering community also classifies material as being brittle or ductile based on their reaction to imposed loads and resistance forces. So it's important to know these two definitions. Brittle is a material that will fracture or fail as it is deformed or stressed. Ductile is a material that will bend, deflect, or stretch as a load is applied, yet it will retain some of the strength. So simply stated, a brittle material breaks before it bends, and a ductile material will bend before it breaks. Wood, plastic, and most metals are ductile, whereas masonry, tile, cast iron are brittle. Now with an understanding of building characteristics, we can now discuss individual materials. So important notes for this section. Factors can help material to work or fail can be defined as type, shape, orientation, mass, and surface. The surface to mass ratio of a material is especially important to firefighters. Mass is heat resistant. Loss of mass means loss of time during fires. Most new buildings are comprised of high strength and low mass materials such as lightweight wood construction. Material can also be classified as either brittle, again breaking before bending, or ductile, which bends before it breaks. Specific building materials. In the past, four basic materials were used to erect buildings. 
and those four materials are wood, steel, concrete, and masonry. Now, today's advances with modern material have created composites of the aforementioned materials, as well as new plastics, graphite, wood derivatives, and exotic metals. So, first, let's look at the four basic building materials, wood, steel, concrete, and masonry, as well as some of the new composites, particularly wood composite, which is often referred to as engineered wood. And in this section, we'll take a closer look at wood as it is the most predominant building material of the past, present, and likely in the future as well. Engineering wood, however, are not only progressively replacing native wood, but also concrete and steel that have previously been used as structural members in building construction. Again, this modern building style is super strong. However, it is also super light and less dense. So again, it makes it more vulnerable to fire. So it does not last long when a building is burning, so it is prone to collapse. Native wood or sawn lumber. Whole lumber pieces cut from trees are not created equal. There are hardwoods, softwoods, tight grain, knotty, old growth, and new growth woods. Each has interesting characteristics and the true craftsman woodworkers know how to maximize the strengths and application of each. However, it would be easy to assume that wood taken from the trees of today is roughly the same as wood that was taken from trees yesterday. Unfortunately, that is not the case as it is relatively easy to overlook the fact that wood currently being used in modern building construction is significantly different from the wood that was used in older construction. From a logging perspective, old growth trees that were common 100 years ago are just a memory. With new growth trees and plantation trees normally replacing the older ones. Interestingly, it is common for today's timber industry to harvest trees similar to corn or wheat. As an example, pine and spruce trees can often be cut 25 years after they are planted. This is why modern lumber trucks routinely carry numerous smaller logs, instead of yesterday's logging trucks that routinely carried several large logs. This has resulted in wood that is not only different, but wood that also burns significantly hotter and faster. Now the old growth trees produce a wood that is denser and has a reduced level of pitch, which burns like a petroleum based product. Additionally, in the past, it was not uncommon for wood, particularly wood that was to be used for structural members to be cut from the heart of a tree, which is the, the densest part. Conversely, new growth trees are less dense and have a higher concentration of that pitch. And that pitch is, you know, uh, like that sap. And again, it's like an oil and it burns relatively quick and hot. Now, this has resulted in wood that is lighter in weight, which can, of course, reduce the strength. It is capable of burning more rapidly and with a higher BTU. As a result, it should not be surprising that around 1986, the lumber industry changed its rating system from utility and standard construction grade and select to three, two, and one, with one being the best. Douglas Fir was the standard for exterior building walls. Essentially, it was the good stuff. It was the, the grade A, the number one. With white fur or hemlock used for the interior walls, and, and that being the, the level three or the cheap stuff. Today, the building construction industry routinely uses the aforementioned cheaper grade of lumber for your exterior 
load-bearing walls. To compound the problem, today's saw wood is known as a nominal dimension lumber as opposed to yesteryear, which was full dimension. So with the full dimension lumber, a two by four was really two inches by four inches. Unfortunately, the nominal dimensions of today, a two by four really only measures about an inch and a half by three and a half inches. And, and even that's not exact when you start looking at these boards up close with a ruler. When the preceding factors are combined, it should not be surprising that your modern structures are built with this type of lumber. And when it did that, it made it lighter and more volatile to flame than yesteryear. So again, we lost mass, we lost time, and, and of course, we made it more flammable. But in, from an engineering perspective, hey, it's great because it's light, it's cheaper, and it does the job. Unfortunately, uh, it, it doesn't help us out in terms of firefighting. So with these cheaper mass, you have less of a warning sign when a wall or a support beam is going to collapse. Uh, they'll just, you know, snap in a moment's notice or a blink of an eye. And in the past, when you had stuff that was more dense, uh, you know, you could hear the cracking, you could start seeing it to bend, and you knew it was time to get out. Traditional wood products used here, the phrase traditional wood products refers to the century old development and improvement of manufactured wood products for a specific application that cut lumber cannot fill. Namely, what they're talking about here is heavy timber, glue, laminate beams, columns, and sheathing. Within the context, engineer wood refers to modern technology advanced wood products and is covered separately after this section. First, we have glued laminate heavy timber. Originally, the common availability of large trees meant that large pieces of sawn lumber were available for use in sizable buildings that required large ports and structural members. And this is the kind of stuff that you see in your old mills and what is commonly referred to in the fire service is that uh, heavy timber. But as large trees began to become more and more rare, the original glue laminate beam columns or golem for short was born from that fact. And trees only grow so wide and so thick it was discovered quickly that heavy timber beams could be created by using these smaller cuts of lumber pieced together. Now, originally these pieces were strapped or bolted together before suitable glues were developed. As described here, golems are heavy timber and can absorb lots of heat prior to failure. They also burn forever. However, under heavy or lengthy fire conditions, the golems can fail and often cause a failure of a large section of a building. Basically, the glues that are deeply impregnated are protected by the sheer mass of the wood pieces used. However, remember that glue or adhesives can, depending on their chemical composition, emit a toxic gas when burned or exposed to heat. Now, sheathing basically refers to something that is covering. So you have floor and wall sheathings, and your traditional wood sheathings include plywood, particle board, and decorative paneling, you know, stuff that you probably see in your, uh, you know, grandparents' house. So plywood, often called the original engineered wood product, plywood is made from layering sheet veneers of wood such that grain directions 
alternate at a 90 degree angle with each layer. These layers are glued to each other as they lay them together. There are various grades of strengths and application of plywood based on its grain density, thickness, and the coating of glue. Now when exposed to fire, the plywood layers start to char and burn away, layer by layer. When exposed to serious heat, as opposed to the flame, the layers dry out and begin to curl. The destruction is usually easy to detect. Obviously, the thicker the plywood sheets, the longer it can withstand heat and flame. But similar to other wood products using that glue compound for bonding and strength, a toxic smoke can be emitted under fire conditions. Generally speaking, plywood has been replaced with a true engineered wood product known as OSB or oriented strand board, which is covered in a, in a following section. Next, we have particle board, which is wood sheeting made from a coarse sawdust and glue, and it is known as, of course, particle board. Particle board appears very smooth and consistent and has no wood grain whatsoever. The sheathing is relatively heavy due to the compaction of the sawdust and the glue during the manufacturing process. Even with density, your particle board sheathing is actually quite weak with a low resistance to trauma, meaning it'll crack and crumble easy. In fact, its own weight can cause a large sheet to crack just from being flexed. Because of its fragility, particle board used as floor or roof covering must be well supported with closely spaced joists or, or beams that it, lay on top, that it lays on top of, and including a durable surface covering as well. Fire and heat will easily destroy the particle board. Particle board breaks down so easily in heat conditions that it is the sheathing of choice for pyrolysing or the off-gassing in terms of your flashover simulators. Uh, if you have never have been to a flashover simulator uh, in your career, I highly encourage you to find one and take that class. It's uh, a great learning tool, especially in terms of fire behavior. Now, the smoke produced from the breakdown of the particle board is full of those wood particles and sticky aerosols, basically those hydrocarbon-based glues. And of course, those are quite flammable and toxic. Now, I do want to point out here, do you see a trend on the, the toxicity with all these uh, products that are, that are somewhat engineered? And of course, this is another class, but you really have to keep that in mind when you're doing your salvage and overhaul. So keep your BAs on. I know, you're, I know we're hot. I know we're tired when we get to that point. But this could definitely be one of the, the reasons that we have such a high rate of cancer occurring in the fire service in terms of our health. So, so take care of yourself. Next, we have decorative sheathing. And this is thin wood paneling used to finish your interior walls or on the outside of cabinets. And these are your classic examples of that decorative sheathing. These products are not intended to resist any load whatsoever. They're purely decorative. And the sheathing can range in thickness from an eighth of an inch to about three eighths of an inch, which means a high surface to mass ratio. Because of the rapid flame spread characteristics of decorative wood paneling, most are not allowed by code for interior wall finishings. Additionally, if adhesives are used, which in this day and age, it's more than likely that they were glued up with liquid nail or, or some other type of bonding material like that, again, you have your toxic gas under fire conditions. So what are our important tech ways in this section? 
Old row trees were widely used for large timber structural members in older buildings. Those members can resist the effects of fire for a longer time frame than, of course, the newer construction. And this is entirely due to that surface to mass ratio. Newer lumber is typically harvested from new grow trees, which results in a more softer wood with that higher pitch content, which again acts like a petroleum product and burns hot and fast. Older conventional roofs can often sag before collapsing, while your newer lightweight wood trusses do not bend prior to your catastrophic collapse. Traditional wood products refer to your older saw lumbers like glooms and plywood sheathings. Plywood particle board and decorative sheeting uses an adhesive that may emit flammable and toxic gas when exposed to heat and fire conditions. While no official definition exists, the term engineered wood is used by the fire service to describe a host of wood products that use modern methods to transform these wood chips slivers and veneer shavings and even recycle wood products into components that replace your traditional sawn lumber sheathing and other composite structural material the wood used to make engineering wood products is typically derived from new growth forests and rapid growth tree forms. Although in some cases it is possible to manufacture similar engineered cellulose products from other linden containing materials such as your hemp, stalks, wheat straw, and other vegetable fibers. And we'll kind of go more into that in the green construction chapter. But in either case, the wood used for engineered wood products is loose grained, has lots of pitch, and is amazingly lightweight compared to the traditional forest woods. Now once harvested, the wood is then milled into veneers, wood chips, and slivers or shavings, which is basically your shredded wood. The milled product is then processed into forms and emulsified in binding agents. Basically it's kind of wetted down and glued together and then pressed in whatever dimension they want and then they autoclave it or basically cook it uh, which dries it out and allows the glue to cure and bind. Of course as this material breaks down when exposed to heat it is highly combustible and toxic. Now engineered wood products are currently being used as a replacement for your solid sawn woods basically your, your cut lumber. In common applications due to their advertised advantages of higher strength, greater stability over long spans and resistance to shrinking, crowning or twisting and warping, and the ease of manipulation, and efficiency in use in more portions of a tree. Now following are common examples of your engineered wood products that rely on that adhesive bonding string. So keep this in mind. So your engineered wood products are basically wood scraps that have been glued together in whatever dimension that they are needed. Oriented strand board or OSB known mostly by its acronym OSB, is sheeting that is formed with wood shavings and an adhesive. The wood chips are oriented such that the grain directions are randomly orientated and layered. Then an adhesive lock these layers in place such that multi-directional and uniform strength is achieved. OSB is used extensively in new construction as a structural sheathing to form roofs and floor assemblies. And as the web portion, which is the middle section of a wooden I-beam in figure 2-7 on page 19, shows you what one looks like. Now, OSB is subject to degradation by direct sunlight, meaning 
it'll break down. Moisture and heat are also culprits. The heat of a fire or smoke can cause rapid destruction of the OSB. Likewise, direct flame contact will cause the OSB to ignite and burn rapidly and emit the toxic gas from the glue. The strength in a company of OSB has led to a proliferation of its use in residential buildings. As an example, a typical 1,800 square foot two-story new home would use a concrete foundation, I-beams for the floor joists, OSB sheeting for the floor, OSB I-beams for the second floor joists, and OSB stair treads and kickers and risers. Exterior OSB sheeting and OSB roof sheeting attached to the trusses that may also include OSB stiffeners. As a result, a major portion of this new traditional home would be comprised of wood chips that are glued together. So you kind of see the problem here developing with this modern construction material. Next, we have laminated veneer lumber. To form laminated veneer lumber, thin sheets of veneer of native wood are stacked with the grains aligned. Notice that's different from the OSB, which is kind of whatever direction. So your laminated veneer lumber are stacked with the grains aligned and then glued now, laminate veneer lumber is used in place of cut lumber to form beams. Laminate veneer lumber is also used to form the cords that are glued to the OSB web of an engineered wooden I-beam. Laminate veneer lumber is designed to have the load imposed axially and perpendicularly to the grain. While the mass of laminated veneer lumber is typically higher than OSB, it is still degraded by the heat of fire and smoke. Because laminate veneer lumber is formed with native wood veneer, the individual sheets hold together until the wood burns. The glue that binds each layer tends to cause delamination of the veneer sheeting by sheet when heated. Laminate veneer lumber is commonly used as a replacement for conditional saw lumbers and timbers for your beams, joists, rafters, columns, and studs, and rim bores. Next, we have laminate strand lumber, which is a structural composite lumber manufactured from flaked and chip strands of native wood blended again with the glue. Mostly, laminate strand lumber uses strands orientated in a parallel fashion. And again, notice how that is different. So when you're trying to differentiate the different terms, and it's important to know, hint, 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 cough, 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 that OSB is no particular direction laminate veneered lumber is positioned with the grain aligned and the laminate strand lumber is parallel. Now the primary difference in laminate veneer lumber uses sheets veneer of native wood where our PSL uses flaked wood strands. The glue may be some sort of phenolic rhizin, uroformation, or phenomenal formahydation. And of course, all these glues are derived from crude oil. Now, fire behavior wisdom suggests that laminate strand lumber and PSL will fail before your laminate veneered lumber or your laminate strand lumber. Laminate strand lumber and PSL can be used as beams, headers, studs, and rim boards. Next, we have cross laminate timber. 
Cross laminate timber is an engineered wood product using several layers, three to seven or more, boards that are laid crosswise, typically rotated 90 degrees, and glued. Cross laminate timbers is used as a structural element for columns. Cross laminate timber uses actual timber boards cut from smaller trees to form a panel in the crosswise layers. In many ways, crossed laminate timber is a structurally sound form of plywood, but thicker. Crossed laminate timber can also be used for long spans and structural assemblies that are used for roofs, walls, and floors. This product is gaining widespread acceptance due to its improved acoustics over sawn lumber and its reduced carbon emission footprint. For example, for every one ton of wood, it takes five times more energy to produce. One ton of concrete, 24 more uh, times of energy for one ton of steel and 126 times more energy for one ton of aluminum. Cross laminate timber also advertises a greater resistance to fire. This claim is based on the premise that due to the solid nature of the material, it will char at a slower and predictable rate. The char on wood forms a crust that slowly slows the burning rate and helps shield the wood from further degradation. Glue laminated timber. Glue laminated timber is comprised of multiple layers of dimensional timber bonded together with moisture resistant adhesive. Glue laminate timber is a more modern form of a traditional glue heavy timber covered above. Glue laminate timber can be used as a horizontal beam in vertical columns and can also be produced in curved shapes which makes this product very attractive to interior designers who want a visible structural member that are more decorative than the straight members. Next, we have fingered jointed lumber. Finger jointed lumber has become a common method to produce long lengths of wood members from multiple short pieces of native wood lumber. When joining these short pieces, the joining ends are mitered in an interior locking figures, configurations and then pressed together with coarse glue. Using this process, wood manufacturers can create a long, straight and solid wood choice or stud from a bunch of scrap mill ends. Finger jointed lumber can also be used to join one section of lumber to another, such as a 90 degree angle which is shown in figure 2-9 on page 20. Now the proliferation of engineered wood products over solid wood is based on multiple advantages that include of course greater strength and stiffness. Pound for pound strength that is greater than steel and more efficient use of wood and conformance to a more emerging green or environmental friendly consideration in terms of construction. From a fire service perspective, however, there are big time huge disadvantages with our engineered wood products. Some of these products may burn faster than solid lumber. They have a high surface to mass ratio. Many of the glues are toxic and some of the resin can release formaldehyde. And currently there are four basic types of adhesives that are used in engineered wood products. And basically this releases that, you know, very toxic and flammable gas. And I'm, I'm not getting into these terms and I know I'm hacking up. So what are our takeaways from this section? Engineered wood products and those made from wood chips, slivers, veneers, shavings, and recycled wood that have been bonded using various adhesive methods. The wood used for engineered wood products is often harvested from your rapid growing tree forms. These trees are then milled 
basically shredded into pulp, and the pulp is very lightweight and loose grain and contains lots of that pitch. OSB is the most prolific of the engineered wood products. It is used extensively in modern residential construction to form beams, structural sheeting, and stair assemblies. OSB is very susceptible to heat, degradation, and burning in fire conditions leading to rapid failure. Although engineered lumber can offer many advantages over sawn lumber, it is primarily a disadvantage to the fire service and is threefold. It has already begun to change the way buildings are being constructed when steel and concrete are replaced by wood products, and this is more so in Chapter 6. Some applications can burn faster and with more intensity than the sawn lumber. And many of the adhesives that are used as a bonding agent will, of course, miss toxic gases. Okay, so let's move on to steel, cast iron, and other materials such as aluminum and titanium. Now, steel has been a staple building material for commercial buildings for almost two centuries. It is used extensively for columns and beams, especially in the application where strength, long spans, or tall walls are needed. The classic I-beam and H-beam columns are most associated with steel. However, more recently, lightweight steel C-channels is being used to replace wood studs and occupancies that have non-combustible or low dead load requirements. Now, steel is made from an iron ore, carbon, and an alloy agent. During the manufacturing, iron ore is crushed and made molten using a blast furnace and smelted with coke. Alloying agents are then added to help achieve strength and ductility. The molten solution can then be formed into pieces by casting. Hot rolling or cold rolling casting is just that. The molten steel is poured into desired mold to form the finished product. Hot rolled steel is the result of molten steel shaped at temperatures above the crystallization stage, which allows thinner sheets or shapes. Hot rolled steel is often called extruded steel. The I-beams and H-columns are typically hot rolled extruded. Cold rolled steel is shaped as it is cooled. Some call cold rolled steel cut or rolled steel. Nuts, bolts, cables, rebar, and wires are examples of cold rolled steel. Lightweight C-channel studs are also cold rolled steel. Steel has excellent resistance to compression, tension, and shear forces. Its strength to mass ratio is excellent. Additionally, steel has factory versatility. That is, it is relatively easy to fabricate different shapes, sizes, and strengths during production. For this reason, steel is a popular choice for large commercial structures. From a fire service viewpoint, steel has two weaknesses. It is engineered for very specific applications, and it softens and elongates when it is heated. In a fire, steel acts as a collector of heat. It conducts heat readily. Steel loses strength as the temperature increases. The specific range of temperature at which it loses strength depends on how the steel was manufactured. As a general rule, cold drawn steel like cables, bolts, rebar, and lightweight fasteners loses 55% of its strength at 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot rolled structural steel used for beams and columns loses 50% of its strength at 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Structural steel also elongates or expands at temperature rises at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit. So a 100 foot beam can elongate 10 inches. 
In cases where a steel beam is affixed at both ends and heated, the steel can elongate. Thus, it will twist, sag, or buckle as it tries to expand. This deformation can cause immediate and often general collapse of your floors and roofs. Cast iron is a material usually formed from pig iron, which is a high carbon content iron. The iron is heated until it liquefies and then it is poured into molds to solidify into the desired shape. Because of the high carbon content and lack of alloys, cast iron is brittle. Cast iron has good compressive strength qualities and an acceptable shear strength if the cast iron was formed with significant mass. In the early 1800s and early 1900s, cast iron was used in structural applications such as columns, doors, and wood frames. Many historical buildings still have gorgeous, ornate storefront cast iron columns. Unfortunately, cast iron is brittle and history has shown that it can crack from aging, eccentric, and or torsional loads and trauma. Cast iron has great resistance to slow heating and cooling. In a hostile fire environment, cast iron can initially resist the heat fairly well, but tends to fracture or crumble more easily when an eccentric load is applied. For this reason, cast iron is no longer used for structural application. Research shows that there is still a debate on whether the application of cold water to fire heated cast iron causes explosive fracturing. The debate centers on two arguments. The rapid cooling causes sudden contraction that implodes the brittle material, and the physical forces of the fire stream in an impact load that rapidly separates the brittle material. Regardless, most agree that cast iron is a brittle material that can fail more easily when heated by fire. Aluminum is a natural element that exists in many minerals and ores. In fact, aluminum is the most abundant metal that exists on Earth. Unfortunately, the reactivity of aluminum requires massive amounts of energy and refinement to produce the beer can we are familiar with. As a building material, aluminum is considered a soft metal that is high strength to weight, highly ductile, non-corrosive with air, water, and it is non-magnetic. Because of production costs, aluminum is rarely used for the main structures of a building, but is used extensively for trim, brackets, finishes, sheeting, in special applications where lightweight, non-corrosive materials are needed. During fires, the low mass and ductile nature of aluminum causes rapid failure. Titanium. Like aluminum, titanium is an abundant metal found in many minerals and it is lightweight, low density, non-corrosive, and non-magnetic. Titanium alloys are known for a high strength to weight ratio and tremendous resistance to heat. Most firefighters considered lightweight as a recipe for rapid failure. Titanium, however, is an exception to the rule. For most buildings, titanium is too expensive to be used as a building material, although its lightweight and high strength makes it ideal for innovative architectural designs. As material technology progress, more variants of titanium will be found in building materials. So what are our takeaways here? Steel has been the staple of the building industry for many years and is a structural material that is used for both lightweight studs and lightweight roof structural members as well as primary structural members to form I-beams and H-beams. Steel is made from iron ore, carbon, and an alloy agent that provides increased strength and ductility. Steel products are either hot rolled or cold rolled or cast. Steel has excellent properties such as versatility and resistance to tension, compression, 
and shear forces. Steel will act as a collector of heat in a fire and lose much of its strength above 800 degrees Fahrenheit, which can cause it to elongate, twist, and ultimately fail. Cast iron has been used in the building industry since the 1800s. However, as opposed to steel, it is a brittle material. Cast iron can fracture when heated in a fire and then exposed to water from suppression operations. Aluminum and titanium are abundant materials that have excellent strength to weight ratios. Due to manufacturing costs, neither has been used for structural bones of a building. Although that is starting to change, aluminum fails quickly during fires where titanium shows significant resistance to heat. Concrete is a mixture of Portland cement, sand, and aggregate, which is usually gravel, and water that cures into a solid mass. The curing process creates a chemical reaction that bonds the mixture to achieve strength. During the mixing process, gravel can be added as volume and strength expander. The final strength of concrete depends on the ratio of these materials, especially the ratio of water to the Portland cement. Low slump concrete is stronger and has a lower water to cement ratio, while high slump concrete is wetter and flows easier. Cured concrete has excellent compressive strength but poor tensile and shear strength. Pure concrete is considered a brittle material. For this reason, steel is often added to concrete as reinforcement. When the concrete is being used in a way that will subject it to those forces. When steel is added to concrete, the finished material is considered a composite brittle with some ductile properties. Steel can be added to concrete in many ways during its casting. Reinforced concrete that is poured over steel rebar which becomes part of the cured concrete mass. Pre and post tension concrete. Now, Concrete that has steel cables placed through the plane of the material and then tension compressing the concrete to give it the required strength. Cables can be pre-tensioned or post-tensioned. Pre-cast concrete. Slabs of reinforced concrete that are poured at a factory and then shipped to a job site. Pre-cast concrete can be used for walls, floors, or roofs. Common application of pre-cast concrete are the venerable tilt-up slabs that are used for walls and twin T-slabs used for floors and roofs. Monolithic buildings are concrete buildings built on location using a steel rebar frame and wood or a composite material forms to shape the concrete. Concrete is then pumped into the form encasing the steel, creating a reinforced concrete building. Monolithic is derived from the Latin word for single stone. Monolithic buildings are typically built one floor at a time. The columns are built ahead of the floor and utilize a slip form, which moves slowly upward as each level is poured. Floors are then anchored into cured columns. The floors are built upon a scaffold-like platform. Once a floor cures, the false work is removed and rebuilt on the next level. Now unlike steel, concrete is a heat sink and tends to slowly absorb and retain heat rather than conduct it. The heat is not easily reduced. All concrete contains some moisture and continues to absorb in wick moisture as it ages. When heated, the moisture content expands causing the concrete to crack or spall. Spalling refers to a pocket of concrete that has crumbled into fine particles through the exposure to heat. Spalling can reduce the critical mass of the concrete, the mass used for strength. Steel rebar becomes exposed to a fire and after spalling can easily conduct heat within the concrete mass, causing catastrophic spalling and failure of the structural element. Concrete can also stay hot long after the fire is out, causing additional thermal stress to firefighters performing overhaul. 
As an example, these conditions were present in the Central Library Fire in Los Angeles, and we'll go more into that in Chapter 4. Menacenary is a common term that refers to brittle material like brick, tile, concrete, block, and stone. The classic concrete masonry unit, some call it a cinder block, is the most common material used for building as a masonry wall. Masonry is used to form load-bearing walls because of its compressive strength, but it can also be used to build a veneer wall. Individual Masonry units are held together using mortar. Now, mortar is a workable paste made from a mixture of sand, cement, or lime, and then water. Once cured, the mortar serves as a binding agent for masonry blocks. These mixtures have little to no tensile or shear strength. They rely on compressive forces to give the masonry strength. It is important for firefighters to know that a masonry wall actually gets stronger as the axial loads are applied and compressive forces increase. Obviously there is an absolute maximum weight that can be applied before a brittle material fails. Individual bricks and stones have excellent fire resistant qualities. Oftentimes masonry walls will be standing after a fire has ravished the interior of a building. Even though the wall is still standing, the loss of the roof means the wall no longer has the compressive force needed for strength. The wall is unstable and can collapse quickly with an eccentric load like wind. The masonry wall also has an Achilles heel, the mortar used to bond the individual units. Mortar is subjected to spalling, age, breakdown, and washout. During a fire, masonry blocks can absorb more heat than mortar used to bond them, creating a different heat stress that can crack the binding mortar. Whether from age, water, or fire, the loss of the bond causes the masonry wall to become very unstable. Composites New materials, technologies, are posing interesting challenges for the fire community. The term composite can be used for many things, but in this case it refers to a combination of the previous mentioned basic materials as well as various plastics, glues, exotic metals, and assembly methods. One thing is certain, these materials are designed to often maximize strength with minimal material mass. A dangerous proposal in the structural firefighting environment given that several composites are commonly used for building materials. Plastics. Simply stated, a plastic is a synthetic or semi-synthetic material that is made of multiple polymers. Most plastics are derived from petroleum. The hydrocarbon chemical chains formed in crude oil can be altered with other chemicals to form many different products. While there are thousands of chemical named plastics used in everyday life. Most plastics can be divided into thermal plastics and thermal setting plastics. Thermal plastics can be heated and reshaped without losing the inherent composition found in the plastic. Thermal setting plastic uses heat to harden or set the plastic. Reheating a thermal setting plastic will change the composition and it will likely result in a breakdown. Most plastics are considered ductile. The building industry is the second leading consumer of plastics in the U.S. Since the mid-1960s, plastics have been increasingly used for just about everything except the structure itself. That is now changing. Plastics are now being used to reinforce wood and concrete. Several all-plastic buildings have been constructed to demonstrate the potential of plastic to replace wood, steel, and concrete. Clearly the trend is for more plastics to be included as the building materials. From a firefighter's perspective, this trend can have negative impacts on building stability. During fires, as most plastics melt at relatively low temperatures and emit very explosive gases that add tremendous heat release when the hydrocarbons burn. 
carbon fiber reinforced polymers. Carbon fiber reinforced polymers are composed, or excuse me, are composite materials that include a reinforcing material that is bonded together with a polymer. Carbon fiber is an amazingly strong and be woven or shaped in many forms. To put things in perspective, the carbon content of steel helps give steel its strength. Manufacturers have figured out a way to take that essential strength element, crystallize the bonds, and form a fiber. The fiber is a fraction of the thickness of human hair, pliable in heat, and corrosive and rot resistant. Because of the cost, they are not prevalent as a building construction material, although engineers are finding applications of carbon fiber reinforced polymers for reinforcing concrete and steel. As the cost comes down, more applications will be found. <clears throat> Under fire conditions, carbon fiber reinforced polymers offer initial heat resistance until the polymer breaks down. Once the actual carbon fibers are exposed to flame, they are separated and release microscopic carbon particles that can burn. The particles from carbon fiber reinforced polymer smoke are especially destructive to microelectronic circuit boards as they can form a conductive path between components. The expanding use of composites for many types of building materials will certainly change the basic perception of fire ground operations that have been taken for granted for many years. This is a primary reason why firefighters must keep abreast with technology and result change in building construction, particularly in your area of responsibility. So what are our takeaways in this section? Concrete has been a primary building material for hundreds of years and is a combination of sand and aggregate water and Portland cement. Concrete is known for its high compressive strength, but has poor tensile and shear strength. Steel is added to concrete as reinforcement for application that require tensile and shear qualities. Reinforced concrete can be formed as monolithic pre or post tension or precast. Concrete will absorb and also radiate stored heat and can spall when exposed to heat from fire. Masonry often refers to brick, tile, concrete block, and stone. Similar to concrete, masonry products have good compressive strength and are generally resistant to heat from fire. In particular, CMUs have become very popular due to their strength, resistance to fire, and minimal ongoing maintenance. These factors are a benefit to the fire service. Standard materials that are commonly used in building constructions are constantly evolving in concrete with advances in technology. And as a result, the term composites is becoming more familiar to building construction methods and material. Two notable examples are plastic and carbon fiber material. Okay, your chapter review exercise. Answer the following questions. Okay guys, if you have any questions, you can email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can give me a call in my office at 706-357-0162. Also remember this week, I want you to do the National Fire Academy Online Building Construction class. You will have to create an account and get your identification number if you already don't have one. And if you've lost it, they have a reset link to send it to you. Until next time, be safe and have a great day.